Today's episode of the Gold Cast is sponsored by 2-0. This is the first time, Rimmon, the 49ers have been 2-0 to open the season with two road games since 1989. This is the first time this team has gone 2-0 to start a season since 2012, the, uh, the dark Super Bowl year. This is the most yards and points put up in a 49er game since 2013. The last great year of the 49ers have had this decade. So this this game, this episode of the Goldcast is dedicated to 2-0. and Now, Raymond, before we get started, why don't you let them know where can they find us? You can like us on Facebook.com slash The Goldcast, and you can also follow us on Twitter at The underscore Goldcast, and you can also subscribe to us via iTunes, YouTube, and Stitcher, all under the same moniker of The Goldcast. Like, subscribe, and comment, because we have a lot to go over. We sure do, man. We have so much to go over. Game two, week two is in the books. We are fired up. This is 49ers at the Bengals, week two, instant reactions. But first, the greatest fanalist in the game is here. Your professor of fanalism is here. Class is in session. Let's go. San Francisco, are you ready? ready? This is the Gold Cast. Boom! Welcome to another edition of the Gold Cast. We are the voice of the Bay. I'm your host, Rudy Salisa III, and with me is my brother, my co-host. Raymond Salisa I, baby. Raymond, let's go! Winner, winner, chicken dinner. That's right, 2-0. 2-0, holy crap, what a game. So, we've been celebrating my wife's birthday all weekend. So naturally, I got home, Raymond, very late last night. Good for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I got home very late. We had a great time. We were at Earth, Wind, and Fire last night at the Hollywood Bowl. What a show. They ended, Raymond, we're going on a tangent, then we're getting to what everyone wants to hear. They ended the show with September, which was also the first song that Jessica and I danced to. And it, they, did, they had an entire fireworks display for the In entire show. In the month of show. September, on In the, September 14th. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Jessica's favorite band right there. And they had fireworks for the entire song. Throughout the entire song? From beginning to end, straight wow. fireworks. They never once stopped. And then they went into a huge fireworks display finish, and that was all she wrote. So is it safe to say that that fireworks display was above and beyond what anybody typically sees on 4th of July? I would say it felt like a 4th of July finish. Mm. Now, I say this to say, this is all leading into game one right here. I woke up early. I was very tired. (laughs) And I was watching that naturally. I was watching that first quarter with like one eye open. But slowly but surely, the Niners started playing better. And better and better and really picking it up. And before I knew it, by the middle of the second quarter, I was wide awake and I was starting to cheer and I was starting to go crazy going, yes, this is the team here. They're coming. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. I was watching this team gel. First of all, uh, offenses uh, one week early. I'm really happy. I'm really happy about that. One week early, I, I was saying week three, what, somewhere between week three and four, Jimmy G and that offense sh- showed up in week two, and they really started to put this thing together. You know, J- Jimmy G was 17 to 25, 297 yards, three TDs. We do have the one interception, but damn, holy crap. Let's get into this, Ray. What did you think? What did you see? I mean, I, I just saw a team that – started competently and went from competent to competent to destruction all in one game. Tell me what you saw. I saw really 
so the first thing I'll say with is, first of all, Kyle Shanahan absolutely dissected the Bengals defense. So any semblance of that prowess that we saw last week against Seattle was completely wiped off the table. The offensive line dominated the line of scrimmage against the Cincinnati defense, the front, uh, the front four in particular, they like to drop a four and five. And on the other side, our defensive line was just really kind of pushing around the offensive line for Andy Dalton. And so on both sides of the football, the line of scrimmage was dominated. And that really led to Kyle Shanahan just had his way. And I, I know people really love player breakdowns, and we're going to get to that. But that's kind of what I was noticing when I was watching the game. I was like, Kyle Shanahan is calling screens. He's calling these rollouts. He's calling these these unique passes that all kind of – it wasn't it wasn't like some of the plays I've seen him call before. I mean, he really kind of – I felt like the playbook opened up a little bit more in this game, not so much open up. When I say open up, I don't mean like plays downfield or big chunk plays like that you see, you know, reminiscent of, you know, a New Orleans offense or a Kansas City offense. But I just mean like very creative players. We saw the flea flicker to Dante Pettis. It was actually the only positive thing Dante Pettis did on the field where he caught the ball, turned around, threw it back. And I was, you know, you're thinking like, is that the first read? I was like, no, these are design plays because the offensive linemen, every time we saw a couple plays like that where he throws immediately after the snap, throws to his left, uh, a lot of times he's th- Jimmy's throwing to his left. And when they're doing that and you see the offense, two offensive linemen are already down the field, these are design plays. This, this, is, the, the, this is the first intentional read that he wants to make with these plays. And so because we were dominating so, so – well so early I was like man I was like Kyle Shannon is just having his way with these play calls he's he's calling first of all the running game was outstanding the passing game was outstanding Jimmy had the one pick and the one thing I'll say about the one pick was to me I felt like it was Jimmy feeling like he had to make up from the back-to-back penalties that put us in a second and 20 situation when it's like you have it down to play with just make the short pass get us like maybe eight to 10 yards and then play a regular third down, a regular third and long, and then go from there instead of trying to get the big, the big play to make up for the 20 yards and throwing into triple coverage, because that's, you know, more often than not in multi coverages like that, you're going to see picks, you know, and I know he got lucky, you know, last week when he did that uh, with Kendrick Bourne and he did that also with Kendrick Bourne in the preseason before that, um, with the triple coverage. So, but if he keeps doing things like that, you know, he's going to average a pick a game. So obviously that needs to be cleaned up and that's more of a discipline thing than anything like that, than anything else, you know, and last week pick six, that was just a really bad, you know, kind of a, just a bad read on his part, but yes, dominant on the line of scrimmage was dominated from first quarter to fourth. Remember what, 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 what do they say? What do the greats say? You build from the middle out. The offensive line was fantastic. The defensive line was fantastic. Defense came out to feast. All all of the usual suspects got in there. Eric Armstead with the sack. Solomon Thomas with the sack. Ronald Blair III with a sack. DeForest Buckner with a sack. Four sacks on the day. Nine tackles for a loss. This was a, a defense that refused to let anything through. They were suffocating. Absolutely suffocating. I was completely impressed from top to bottom. What did you see on the defense? Uh, again, line of scrimmage. So the defensive line was outstanding. I know D Ford came out early. He was having some knee problems, and they kept him out. And even with him out, the the, the pressure was still there. I think in the second quarter, Andy Dalton looked a little bit more comfortable. And even in that, um, you know, I know Kwan Williams was really kind of the weakest link I saw today out of the starting lineup. He just got torched all day long, and the offensive plays that once they saw that, they they just kept attacking Kwan Williams, and rightfully so. I didn't see a whole lot out of Richard Sherman today. He had a couple tackles, but he was very quiet. I think the coverage was just really sound, and the same thing with uh, Akella Witherspoon, who again had another really solid day. He had three pass deflections. I think the the group uh, as a group, and and also Kwan Alexander had that pick, so making making up for last week's missed opportunity. And so now the five, six, seven, it was like 
eight eight pass deflections this week, uh, including two from DJ Reed, Julian Taylor, and Quan Alexander had three pass deflections. So this is what I love about Quan Alexander. He had tackles for loss, catching guys in the backfield, and and really playing well against the run. And he's also got the speed to stay in coverage too. And he reflected that skill today. And Akello had another amazing game. Ronald Blair, to me, was the best defensive lineman today. He had a sack and three TFLs alone out of the nine from the group. So that was huge. Uh, Eric Armstead almost got there too. Eric Armstead's been having, through these first two games, Eric Armstead's looked like the player we all were hoping he would become, which is very similar to the way DeForest Buckner already is. So that's terrific because if that, if that, if that, if that, continues then we will have our twin tower you know tandem that we've always been looking forward to these two six seven monsters all playing at the same skill level so that was exciting to see i really hope he he is able to maintain that because he's just he's playing with a lot more confidence and i think he's getting more opportunities because the offensive linemen uh the, the offensive you know game plans have to really cater to to more than one defender. It's no longer just a Forrest Buckner. You know, uh, Nick Bosa on the play when he almost got the sack was triple teamed on that play. And, or I, I'm sorry, uh, Solomon Thomas is a uh, lone sack of the day. Uh, he got triple teamed on that play um, before that. So, you know, it's, um, to me, I, I, the whole group is just playing more sound football. I feel like they really have their, they, I think they look more comfortable in this wide ninth setup it obviously takes advantage of where the investments have gone into b- rebuilding this defense, and that's been on the defensive line. And it's paying off. We've had how many sacks through f- two games already? How many pass deflections? We've had turnovers in back-to-back games. We, um, we pick uh, sixes, Kella yeah, Withers- interceptions. Kella Withers- yeah, Keller Witherspoon almost had another pick six today. I mean, he needs to hang on to that and not make little bonehead plays like kicking the football afterwards. But outside of that, he was outstanding. This team looked the defense looked great last week the offense looked shaky we've been saying for an entire month on this gold cast we've been saying for an entire month give the offense three weeks to really settle in and i have to admit i really thought the offense came and played on the level of the defense this is the most well-rounded victory i've seen from the 49ers since 2013 and in fact this is the best they've played since 2013. So it didn't surprise me that this is the first 40-point game we've had since 2013. Yeah, and the offense, I mean, what can you say? Jimmy was super efficient, 17 for 25, 297 yards, three touchdowns, one pick. Very similar to how last week's game line, stat line would have looked for him had we not had the uh, penalties calling back touchdowns, which we had one today. So we had, we, we nailed, we, it got better. We got better. It was less overall penalties and less touchdowns caught. Instead of three touchdowns being nullified by penalties, we only had one touchdown nullified by a penalty today. So that was great. And again, we had this week, um, the offensive line played much better than they did last week. And they were just blasting holes all day long. Matt Breida, 12 carries, 121 yards. He averaged 10.1 yards a carry. He was averaging first downs um, all day long. As a, as well, that's... That's what, but that's what puts you in position, right, Raymond? If yeah. we can convert, if we can con- convert on one down and get another set of fresh downs, we're just marching down the field at that point. That's what, that's really what enabled this 49ers team to play at the level of dominance it needed was the running game. The running game was unstoppable, and no matter who they put in, all three of them, Breda, Moster, and Wilson, all v- killed it, man. They were killed it. Yeah, they did, and and. There was tons of, lots of uh, tackle shedding. So not only were they get were they gashing the hell out of Cincinnati's front, but they were also breaking numerous tackles on every play. It seemed like, um, it seemed like almost every play, whether it was Moster or Jeff Wilson who came in later in the game, it was great to see him get get into the mix, and he ended up getting two touchdowns or two rushing touchdowns came from Jeff Wilson. No, you know I know. Um, I know some people said that they would have liked to see Matt Breida since he was the bell cow get some of those scores. But, you know, it's not, you know, at the end of the day, Kyle Shanahan really doesn't care who scores just as long as we score. So he's going to call, like, just like he said, like, hey, for those of you who have George Kittle on your fantasy, 
you know, don't get too excited because I'm I'm all about the matchups. He's going to go with the matchup mismatches. Debo Samuel had a breakout game today. He led the team in receptions, five, seven targets, five receptions, 87 yards. He had his first touchdown as an NFL pro. Marquise Goodwin chipped in, woke up today. Raheem Mostert was terrific out of the uh, catching the football. George Kittle was targeted three times. He caught all three balls for 54 yards. He's just and he's still a beast in his yak. His yak is just absolutely insane. Matt and then Matt Breeder, Richie James, uh, Juice Check, Kendrick Bourne all chipped in with one catch each. So like Kyle Shanahan is all about spreading the ball around. And we saw that. We saw an incredible Cincinnati was just that's what I mean. Why? Why Kyle Shanahan just really had his way because Cincinnati was just off balance all day long. You know, if your game plan came in saying, let's take out George Kittle. Good luck because you got beat by Debo Samuel. You got beat by Marquise Goodwin. You got beat by Raheem Raheem Mostert and you got beat by George Kittle. So well, you can't you can't just focus on one player. I understand he's our big guy, our big play guy, and he's certainly the best offensive receiver slash tight end on the on the team. But you cannot do not underestimate, you know, Kyle Shanahan's ability to spread the ball around. Hundred percent. But let you know what? To take it a step further, that yes, and you, in particular with George Kittle, really George Kittle really made his bread and butter today on blocking Mm -hmm. my god he was everywhere he was he was the unsung hero on so many of these runs that guy was sitting there just blocking left and right left and right just wherever you looked there he was yeah there was george kittle knocking some Bengal defender down and creating a lane for for a a 49 running back to continue and long and and elongate the yeah him him and kyle use check really were amazing kyle use check is just you know again these are this is kyle use check was a big uh he came out of Baltimore coming off of his, uh, a Pro Bowl, and everyone thought that he was overpaid. And, you know, how many of you still think that Kyle Juszczyk is overpaid now? Because guess what? He's been to the Pro Bowl every year since we brought him over and quote-unquote overpaid him. This guy is tremendous out of the backfield. He can catch the ball. He can run the ball. And George Kittle is a complete tight end. He is not just the best receiving tight end. He is the best all-around tight end in the NFL. He blocks just as good as Kyle Juszczyk. He blocks just as good as our offensive lineman, and he loves to do it. He's not just like, oh, I kind of would prefer to just be involved in the offense. It's like, no, he likes to just be out there playing football, contributing any way he can. He's a 100% total team player, and that's reflective in his overall game. And we saw that there was numerous replays where they just kept showing him, and you could just see him blocking all the time. He made so many key blocks today. Him and Kyle Juszczyk were just all over the place, t- shredding, shredding Cincinnati. So Cincinnati, everyone complimented them because they played really well last week against Seattle, and, sh- and they surely did. They they had their kicker not miss that not miss that field goal. They would have won that game, but they came out today and they looked very much as the announcer called it, like last year's worst defense in the NFL. That's how they look today, and I think it's a combination of them just you know probably not having some of the best talent in key positions. But at the same time, you know, they went against a very good Seattle team last week and hung in there and were in a position in a position to win. So for them to come out this week at home, mind you, and to just get dominated in the fashion that they did, I think speaks more to the evolution of our team versus the Bengals being a bad team. That's how I read it, and perhaps there is some bias coming in there. But the fact that it was so dominant was not, to me, especially based off last week's performance from Cincinnati. I have to lean on the side of just like, this team is not a terrible team. They just got dominated hardcore. And I think perhaps maybe they underestimated San Francisco. I don't know. I'm not in the heads of all these players and coaches. They have a young coach just like we have a young coach, just like the Rams have a young coach. Their coach is 36, so and he's supposed to be a pretty good offensive mind. So let me break this down for you. Let me let me break let me break this down for you. I'll tell you why you are not being biased and overestimating in terms of this win for the 49ers. Because this is a team that hung in with a very good Seattle team that's always very dangerous. But more than that, 
if we really are a good team, then we come in here and we kick the teeth out of the Bengals, which is what we did. I knew we were going to I knew we were going to dominate the Bucks and I think we did a pretty good job of that. You know, we we pretty much shot ourselves in the foot or else that score would have been a lot higher. But if if you're a good team, then you come in you come into Cincinnati and you dominate Cincinnati. If 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 Cincinnati is toe to toe with us, it shows you that okay, we're not bad. You know, we're not bad. But Raymond, I'm starting to think this is a good team. A maybe a really good team. Now, I'm not going to – I'm not – we've got so much football left, so I don't want everyone to think that I'm hot taking it. I'm just right. saying – We do, and, and the first four weeks are really when teams are identifying their identity and getting into the rhythm with everything that they had done in the off season and OTAs and training camp. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And That's so what this September te- is all about. So it's all about. So this team – this team came in and dominated this game the way a good team dominates. Now, remember we were talking about this before. Everyone was talking about how Nick Mullins needs to be the starter and yada, 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 yada. Mm-hmm. The level of Jimmy G is starting QB. It's so much higher. And you look, it was really impressive to see what Kyle Shanahan last season was able to do with a third string quarterback. Look at what he's able to do with a first-string quarterback who is still coming off an ACL injury, who is still finding his footing. Now look at the difference in the level there. Look at the difference in level. That it just Jimmy G. This isn't even top Jimmy G. We're still dealing with a Jimmy G whose ceiling is much higher than it is right now. He still pulls off three touchdowns, 297 yards passing, 17 of 25 completions. That that. That is what happens when you pair Shanahan with a first string top of the line quarterback like Jimmy G. Look at that. And we have so far to go. Wouldn't you agree with that? The ceiling for this for this player is much higher. Yes, we are clearly just getting started here. And but I and I think, you know, the the evolution of the Niners dates back two years, you know, because you know, injuries have really kind of taken guys out of position to work on their craft and get polished. And this year we're not seeing that. I know we lost Joe Staley today. That was huge. He's going to be out for at least half the season or half a season's worth eight games. So that's horrible. And, you know, someone's going to have to step up, step, uh, step up. So I know Skewell came in and played the rest of the game at left tackle. So he's going to have to fill in there. It's unfortunate too, because Staley just got paid, but this is, yeah, I think this is like, no, good teams beat bad teams and great teams demolish bad teams. You know, and this, I'm not saying we're necessarily great. We've just played great in back-to-back weeks, although we certainly had some pretty big missteps in the previous week, but we still dominated by over two possessions. In this case, we, we blew them out as well. That last touchdown was a garbage time touchdown. There was nothing significant about it. But, uh, and I think, you know, and so far, season predictions, you know, 2-0, 2-0. Oh, oh, you know, I I saw us, saw these games as winnable. And, you know, we'll get into, you know, towards the end of the show, we'll give a little preview of a preview of, of next week's matchup. But, you know, so far, I'm seeing the defense finally coming together in the right scheme with the right personnel. And the offense, healthy is doing exactly what it's designed to do, which is to be all over the damn place and extremely well-balanced. Kyle Shanahan is so good. And you know what? And let's, let's talk about Robert Sala. We, we were, we were calling for his head last season. We were, and Sherman famously came out early in the season saying, defending him and saying that, if you don't have the defensive personnel to pull off what Robert Saul is trying to do when he's making, you know, the right call, I'm paraphrasing here, he's making the right calls on defense to stop offenses, it's not his fault. Remember that? Remember Sherman was, was right, very defensive. Exactly. About him? It, it was more or less like, like, hey, he's he's calling the right defenses. Players just aren't executing. And so it makes him look bad. And so and I get that, you know, from from a 
from a, a novice perspective, we don't we just see like, man, this defense sucks, which means the coach must suck. You know, it's kind of a very simple a simple dissection, you know, from fans that we you know, we don't know the X's and O's as well as they do, obviously, which is why they get paid to do that and why Salah hasn't lost his job yet. So so Exactly. And now that he has the personnel, he's doing a fantastic job. He really is. And and you know what? We we talked about this before. Uh, does, does it make him a bad coach that he needs great personnel to do what he does? You know, what, you know, no, it doesn't at all. It, that's pretty standard for most coaches in the NFL. They need the talent to, to, to coach. They need the talent. At, you know, they can't scheme the way like a Harbaugh could scheme the way a, a Kyle Shanahan can scheme. You know, they need, they need the personnel there, you know, where, where Shanahan can do it with virtually anybody, you know, uh, Vic Fangio could do it with virtually anybody. The Robert Saul isn't like that. And most coaches are not. Most coaches are not. So it's great that he has the personnel that he that he needed. And I love that they are executing at the level that they're expected to. And and I have to give my you have to tip your hat off to him because they could still be playing really shitty. And then we could go, no, see, this really was Robert Saul's fault. But now you see Robert Saul, you see Robert Saul's players executing at the level that he needs them to. And they're dominating. Two weeks in, this is a this is the best start since 2013, since 2012, and I'm super happy. And and literally, this team like injected life into me as the day was going on. I was literally getting my eyes were getting wider and wider, and I was cheering louder and louder. And then by mid game, I was just losing it. I was like, oh wow, wow, this is really happening right now. This is awesome. Just the feeling, San Francisco Bay Area. How dope is this? Two and O, oh, baby. You guys let everyone see, let that sink in. Everyone from the Gold Cast Nation, we have been here through thick and thin since 2012. We have been here watching these games, going through these seasons, and now, for the first time in a long time, I'm really happy. I'm really, really happy. I feel. Like, this is a great team, and we might have Raymond looking. Let, let's look. Let's let's look across the pond, across the NFC West right now. We might have a Sunday. We're taping this on Sunday, September fifteenth, at two o'clock in the middle of the day. We might have a scenario where there are three two and O NFC West teams by the end of the day. Rams and Saints are currently playing as we record this episode. I can't wait right. to and they're and tied at, at a field goal piece. Field goal that piece. won't last. No. Arizona we might, lost. We might see a game, Ray. We might see a world where you have three NFC West teams two and zero. Oh. This is fantastic. This is great. I love it. I I can't wait. I cannot wait. I can't wait for next week. And I feel like similar to how we did in the Harbaugh years, week two's in the books. Awesome. On to week three. Yep, yep. On to week three, and week three, you know, we'll, we'll. I think we'll get deeper into week three as the week progresses. I know we, you guys, some of you are looking forward to a, a Bengals Niners preview, um, but uh, we will. We apologize about that, but you know, going into next week, just to give you a taste, you know, Ben Roethlisberger went down against Seattle in that loss, twenty-eight to twenty-six, in Pittsburgh. And now they've got to travel to San Francisco in an opening home game. And if they are a Roethlisberger team coming into San Francisco, then 3-0, and the odds of 3-0 and become significantly higher. Or more likely, I should say. And that's, that's I, I did not feel that way necessarily before that. I thought, you know, because I, I was trying to fit in when we did the preview, it was all about I was trying to get to 10 and six was the goal with uh, the season predictions. And I, I'm not, I can't remember if this was one of the games I called as a potential loss. I think you had us at two and one. I had us at one and two. Pretty sure. Yeah. And now, you know, with the way they've played here and now they're at home. So now this is, you know, football, like a lot of sports are very, football's very momentum based. This momentum's now going to carry us back home for the home opener against a traveling team that has not looked all that great through two weeks. They played much better this week against Pittsburgh, but that was, you know, 
that was still a loss. And this is um this is a very this now this is now a very winnable game going into next week. This is now very winnable. It is very winnable. Very, very winnable. I am super excited, super pumped. We will be back, Raymond, later in the week to preview and dissect the Pittsburgh coming into town. Like you said, a very winnable game. That's a sneak preview. So when you hear us back, this episode is going to be focused solely on reactions. Next episode, we will be discussing and looking ahead towards Pittsburgh. We want to spend a full full episode focused on just that. Raymond, great win. Huge win. Huge win. Uh, 49ers scored in every quarter of this game. They scored double digits in three of the four quarters of this game. And Cincinnati, you know, they scored three out of the four quarters. One was garbage time. They got shut out in third. But Cincinnati was really never in it. They were in it. I'd say this is this has kind of now become a role reversal, right? Where we Niners would say, like, man, we were in that game in the first quarter. We just We just ran out of steam after the first quarter. Where Cincinnati was in this game in the first quarter and that was about it after that they scored a field goal (laughs) they they scored a field goal and they just ran out of steam they ran out of steam real quick real well let's let let's put it this way let's put it this way uh about 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 that last year we we said all year that the 49ers could give you about 30 minutes of football sometimes 45 right and for two straight games, it's been 60 full minutes of football. And I have not seen the 49ers play back to 60 minutes of full football. I, not at this level since 2013. And, 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 and not this, not this, in not such an exciting fashion since the last time Jimmy G was healthy and he went on his five game run. So the last time we did this was with Jimmy G. But at the level of dominance and the level of execution, that I saw today, not since 2013. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. not at all. Uh, the, and again, it really started at the line of scrimmage for for both sides of the football. And you build from the middle out, baby. You exactly. build from the middle out. Exactly. So they never had a chance. I mean, nine TFLs. You're you're not going to have much of a running game with nine TFLs. And I think in the, I think at the end of the day. They had like, gosh, um, yeah, twenty-seven Joe, total yards. Exactly, Joe Mixon had seventeen yards. He averaged a yard and a half. Twenty-five. I'm sorry, twenty-five. Giovanni Bernard chipped in with six carries for six yards. You can figure out that average. And Andy Dalton rushed twice for two yards. So this was just a complete dumb. I'm surprised there's even seventeen points on the board because by some of these stats, you'd guess this would be a shutout performance. And Jimmy, Jimmy, by the way, no sacks against Jimmy Garoppolo today. Only no two sacks. pass deflections. We know, know there was a pick, but only one TFL, no sacks, and two pass deflections. That's what the, their defense did to our offense today. Yep. Excellent job. Excellent job by the 49ers. Excellent job by you, 49er faithful. Sticking through two weeks down Next week, Steelers are coming into town for the home opener. We will be previewing that on our next episode. Also, real quick, Ray, Drew Brees has gone down in that Saints game. I just got just saw the announcement, and now the Rams have just put up another touchdown. We're gonna hop off. I gotta watch that game. We, what do you guys think? Tell us how you feel about this win. How do you feel about Jimmy G? How do you feel about the defensive line? Let us know in the YouTube comments at youtube.com slash the gold cast. And so concludes another edition of the gold cast. We will. I'm your host. I'm like messing up the whole call off. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got football stars. Win, in my win, eyes. Wins will do that to you. Exactly. Exactly. We'll see you next time. Same gold cast. T- oh, wait. Damn it. I'm your host, Rudy Solis the Third, <laughs> And with me is my brother, my co-host. Raymond Solis the First, baby. Boom. We'll see you next time. Same gold cast time. Same gold cast channel. Let's go, Niners. Let's go. 
This is, this is the Gold Cast.